the three notes. Ananda, one of Buddha's chief disciples, had served him for decades. He had revered him, looked up to him, loved him, and had devoted his whole life to Tathagata, the one gone beyond. O oh, sage, you've helped so many to gain enlightenment, he said to Buddha one day. Why is it that I never experienced that deep samadhi you talk about? And Buddha smiled and said, That's because you are still tied to me, Ananda. Untie all knots if you want to experience true awakening. Ananda was quite puzzled at Buddha's response. What are you saying, Tathagata? He said. If I wouldn't reach the other shore by following you, then how will I? A calf gets home safely when it follows its mother. You are already home, Ananda. It is only that you don't realize it. Untie yourself and venture out into the uncharted territories of your mind to know what lies there. Ananda was dismayed at Buddha's response. He felt he had wasted his whole life because all throughout, he had believed that following Buddha meant awakening. But here the sage was telling him the opposite. Three months later, Buddha at the ripe age of 82 passed away and Ananda was devastated to be left behind. In that great pain of separation and sadness, he sat down to meditate. Hardly a few minutes had passed when he entered into deep trance. In that state of awakening, he had a profound realization. A chain, whether of gold or iron, is a chain nonetheless. You cannot experience true freedom as long as you are tied to anything at all. On the path of awakening, all knots must be untied. The umbilical cord must be cut if you want to discover an identity of your own. We wouldn't know how to deeply we wouldn't know how deeply we are attached to something till we distance ourselves from it. The process of Kundalini awakening or its understanding is incomplete without an intimate knowledge of the three knots that bind each one of us. At every loop, every knot, a rope loses its smoothness. Our knots too make us uneven and they rob us of our smoothness. Just like every knot shortens the rope, our knots truncate our strength and character. Not coincidentally, in Lalita Saharashna, you Lalita say? Lalita Sahasranama. Uh, la, Lalita Saharasnama. Sahasra. Sahasra. Sahasra means thousand. Sahasra. Yeah. Nama. The thousand names of the goddess. Exposition of Kundalini does not start from chakras, but the three knots. There are 182 verses in the Shrota. Stotra, out of which are 15 directly linked to the chakras. They mention the sadhana, hidden aspects, the nature of chakras, their forms, colors, and syllables. But the first three verses stand independent on their own. They only talk about how the kundalini rises as it pierces the three knots. There is no mention of chakras until much later. Undoing the knots is a sadhana in its own right, though. And like any other sadhana, it's not without hurdles, both within and without. Without Overcoming hurdles. There are two types of hurdles in any sadhana, external and internal. External hurdles primarily refer to a lack of conducive environment, which includes natural calamities, an unsafe place, lack of social support, non-availability of proper food, and so forth. External challenges are of two types, adi bautik, hurdles that hinder your progress due to lack of resources, and adi daivik, obstacles created by nature, such as storms, wild animals, and so on. External challenges are not hard to overcome. You can change your place where your needs are provided for, and these challenges disappear. Here's the thing with external challenges. The more you turn inwards, the less, the less they matter. During my own days of sadhana in the woods, the more I intensified my practice, the less external factors mattered. After a while, nothing or no one from rats to langurs bothered me any longer. They were there, but they ceased to exist for me. As the inner storms, langurs and rats settled down, the ones outside became powerless. No matter whether you are in the woods or in an air-conditioned penthouse, there will be plenty of external hurdles. We can't let them stop us though. Besides, when compared to the daunting challenges within, the ones without feel like a breeze, 
a piece of cake. Internal hard disks as well are further divided into two types. Athi, Daivik, ones that arise from physical ailments in the body and Adhyatmika challenges that block your progress because of thoughts, emotions and desires. Adhi Daihik could be asthma, arthritis, even common cold or any other disease for that matter. Anything that arises from within your body and disrupts your meditation or focus is an internal hurdle. A Sathak's main challenge, however, remains to be the internal hurdles of the second type, Adhyatmika. This is where the three nodes come into play. They are called Brahma Granthi, Vishnu Granthi and Rudra Granthi. Among the three of them, they cover the whole spectrum of inner challenges that any sadhak encounters on the path of awakening of the Kundalini. For the most part of our lives, we are battling with ourselves. We try hard to resist certain unwholesome emotions, thoughts and desires and we try very hard to cultivate some desirable ones. We want to forgive certain people but feel guilty because we can't let go of the hurt they caused us. We want to be happy. We don't want to feel hatred for anyone or be lustful. Yet it seems that our emotions and thoughts have a life of their own. We are trying to persuade our feelings and thoughts. We want to strike a friendship but they don't seem to be interested. In retaliation, rather than understanding, we begin resisting them. We start avoiding them. This resistance turns into a note and it complicates our lives. Not the point. Our notes, they tie us, trip us and shorten us. Mooladharaika nilaya Brahma Granthi Vibhedini Manipurantha Rudita Vishnu Granthi Vibhedini Ajna Chakranta Ralastha Rudra Granthi Vibhedini Sahasra Rambuja Rudha Sudha Sara Bhivarshini Tadillata Samaruji Shachakropari Samstita Mahashakti Kundalini Pisatantu Taniyasi This is from Lelata Sathradama. It's a 38 to 40 verses. From Muladhara, the root chakra, Kundalini moves, pierces the Brahma node in the Swadhisthana, the sacred chakra, goes through the solar plexus and pierces the Vishnu Granthi in the heart chakra, continuing straight through throat and brows, pierces the Rudra Granthi in the head. There it meets with the thousand petaled lotus and enjoys shower of bliss and divine intoxication. The nature of Kundalini is like the batteries of lightning and flashes as it raises above the six chakras, completely drunk with the nectar. Its form is subtler than even a fraction of the billionth part of a strand peeled from the lotus stem. When you are filled with positivity and light, when you start to see the real you, you bloom on your own. It's effortless. And when you blossom and open up, the nodes loosen and then disappear. As you evolve spiritually and progress on the path, these nodes begin to untie themselves just like lotuses open on their own when sunbeams caress them. In the actual process of Kundalini awakening, you don't have to focus on any of the nodes as such. There is no visualization of untying them as well. When nodes are formed with a muscle spasm, you just let it be. You you massage it tenderly and it goes away. Similarly, when you gently massage your soul, it starts to relax. You begin to be at perfect ease with yourself, with how, what, who and where you are on the journey of life. This is the beginning of Kundalini awakening. In the Hindu tradition, Brahma's job is to create, Vishnu's role is to sustain and Rudra or Shiva's job is to terminate. These are the three roles that also tie us down. 
the desire to create is brahma granthi the desire to hold on is vishnu granthi and the desire to get rid of what you don't like is rudra granthi respectively they also re- represent three major elements of human life sex emotions positive and negative and destructive thoughts let me dwell deeper into them brahma represents creation and also the aspect of procreation therefore not by coincidence the nada brahma is in the sacral chakra your genitals more specifically kundalini starts from the root chakra at the base of the spine that is where the greatest concentration of nerves lies the strongest desire in any individual is a desire to create because this desire is directly linked to a release of the creative energy in you you can call it sex sex is not merely satiating your lust it is your most creative aspect nature compels you impels you and propels you to constantly find avenues where this creative energy may be used so this uh, creation also like uh, he mentioned in the beginning the different types the adhi bhautika which is the physical realm adhi daivika means the divine and adhyatmika means the spiritual so this creation also happens in all these different uh, realms dimensions like at the physical level creation is probably associated with the sex and you know passion the lust but uh, creativity can also happen at the intellectual level at the emotional level at the at a different uh, dimensions of the chakras right so it's not just necessarily associated with the sacral chakra i think it's all interconnected it's all they all interact uh, with each other uh, yeah and yeah. the sacral chakra doesn't have to be only linked to procreation mm-hmm. as well like those aspects of creation right. creativity don't have to only be physical mm even emotions for that matter like uh, the solar plexus the heart so at um, the lower emotions are there yeah um, like more evolved like uh, compassion you know same like love if love is there hatred is there that uh, that is something which has the opposite so that is probably uh, happening at the solar plexus region as we evolve into the higher centers you know me go to the anahata chakra da so there are different petals mm-hmm. uh, of the chakras each petal has a different attribute right so um, uh, one petal maybe it is governing particular type of emotion another petal represents another particular type of emotion and when each one of the mees dealt with is the you know total flowering of that chakra i wouldn't say there's necessarily higher and lower though like i think when any of those chakras are like clarified then their perfected state isn't higher or lower than another one we need to use those terminologies just for conventional purpose it doesn't mean one is uh, you know greater or one is lesser it's but like grosser or finer like i think even the lower chakras in the body like regionally like mm-hmm. when they're clarified their essence isn't grosser than the higher chakra necessarily So it's all like one continuum of this energy hmm. that is the same energy but the gross to subtle you know the journey is from the gross to subtle from the spirit from the physical to the spiritual everything is part of the same source everything is the same energy is probably if you compare uh, just for an example like the water if you take in the different forms in a solidified form as ice and then like uh, liquid form of water and to the steam you know the gaseous form of the water is the same water content anyway it's all same it's too but when it becomes when it comes into the gaseous form it transcends the gravity and it levitates it goes up silhouetted whereas uh, the solidified form or even the liquid form is more fluid but uh, you know the solidified wave form is more solidified and uh, it's pertaining to the gravity so different rules apply uh, that's what i meant by like higher and lower also it doesn't mean that it, it's still water like you said that point is also valid but uh, how you feel about it if you are still in the realm of feeling and so transcend that that is a totally different uh, state of which we cannot talk about but until then you know you feel lighter you might feel heavier i guess i'm also comparing it to like uh, the tibetan 
like where we think of the body, speech, and mind, because in uh, Vajrayana, in the Tibetan form, they're saying the body is located in the third eye or the crown chakra, Om, and then Ah, the speech in the throat chakra, and then Hong, the mind, like in the heart chakra or solar plexus. So they're saying that they're not saying your mind dwells in your brain, like, but in your heart and in, mm-hmm. in your willpower. So I also have that in mind when we're talking about these different chakras. Um, and then, like you said, when you like reach that radiant rainbow body of enlightenment, then all of these chakras and energies are already completely transformed. So he said, he said before that the three knots are the sacral chakra, the heart chakra, mm-hmm. and then the crown, our third eye chakra. Third eye. Mm-hmm. Rudra Grindhi, mm-hmm. Brahma Grindhi, Vishnu Grindhi, and Rudra Grindhi. These mm-hmm. are the three nodes. And also, you remember in yoga, we have the Mola Bandha, Udhyana Bandha, and Jalantara Bandha. Mm-hmm. And then also, when we have just the gaze, the drishti of looking inward toward the third eye, mm-hmm. it's not a lock necessarily, but maybe it is with the eyes. It's not a breath lock, but. So we left off, uh, nature compels you, impels you, and propels you to constantly find avenues where this creative energy may be used. Nature's only dharma is growth, and every creature in this existence is primed accordingly. The first challenge for any practitioner is to rise above sexual thoughts and desires. By that, I do not mean that you observe lifelong abstinence. You may have to practice it, though, in initial stages. Abstinence is recommended purely from the view of channeling channelizing your thoughts you can better control your mind when you know you can't just have something for a certain period of time it's like when you are trying to write an important letter or article and an mm-hmm. email flashes on to your sh- your friend has shared a link with you and soon as you click on that link you are taken to a news website you finish reading the article and at the bottom there are suggestions for other re- relevant articles you click on one of them and start reading it that article contains another link and you click on that and off you go to another website before you know it three hours have been wasted and you still haven't finished writing the important letter you had you had sit down to complete in the first place (laughs) imagine if you had gone offline while writing that letter there would have been no distractions abstinence is something like that it's going offline for a period of time Mm. so you can concentrate better on what you have to do yeah that makes sense I do not endorse or see merit in lifelong continence because I find it unnecessary and unnatural. I have met countless celibate monks and not even one of them was actually happy being a celibate. They all struggled with it. So what do I mean by rising above sex? You have to be completely comfortable at perfect ease with your sexuality and sexual orientation. During the sadhana, You will have a barrage of thoughts, sensual, sexual, taboo, perverted, and so on. Let them come. Don't react to them. You simply carry on with your meditation on the chakra of your present focus. You did not choose your sexual orientation. You did not choose your sexual thoughts. You were born with them. The more you stop reacting and chasing your thoughts, the less they will bother you. I remember that while growing up, there was an old man and the young children used to tease him because he would react vehemently. He would take his stick and run after them. They would ridicule him. I know it was absolutely cruel. They only provoked him to solicit that reaction from him. One time he went away for a pilgrimage and returned several months after. Soon after, he stopped reacting, and within weeks, the children stopped poking fun at him. When you don't react, a sense of ease arises. Resistance goes away. When you resist something, you have to exert double the force. It is exhausting and demoralizing. Think of abstinence as keeping a fast. When your mind knows, I have to stay hungry for nine days, let's say. On the first day, you can get through just fine. On the second day, it'll be a bit harder. On the next four days, it will be even harder. You will find yourself thinking about food most of the time. In the last three days, you will be counting moments thinking to yourself, only a few days to go, and so on. 
at the end of nine days when you will have the opportunity of having food chances are that you will end up eating in excess like normal food sex too is a food for body and mind once a man visited me he was in his mid-70s he was quite perturbed by the fact that he still had sexual thoughts and was active sexually he felt guilty about it he said i retired years ago and i still have sexual thoughts it's okay, I said. Your body and reproductive organs don't know that you are retired. Sex too is food, I added. As long as you are eating food, your body will want sex too. Mine never retires. So it doesn't make me a bad person, right? On the contrary, it means you are normal. I said, no reason to feel guilty about something you didn't choose. Mine doesn't care whether you are retired from the service or you are a senior citizen. It's alive as ever. Just like you may have the desire of eating fine food or wearing nice clothes or going out, etc. You have sexual thoughts. If you don't give them extra importance, they are just like other thoughts. They emerge, stay for a moment, and then disappear. All said and done, Brahma Granti is not merely the sexual knot, for Brahma doesn't just represent procreation, but creation too. If sex alone was enough to harness our creative energies, we wouldn't be in such a rat race today. No matter how rich or poor one is, whether a millionaire or a billionaire, a local minister or the prime minister, everyone is busy and wanting and acquiring greater share of everything they can have. They want to create, do something more than what they have already done. And this is the second aspect of this knot, to create. Brahma Granti represents creation, expansion, and multiplication. There is no doubt that millions out there need to work very hard all day to support themselves. At the same time, however, there are millions who are incessantly working towards amassing wealth, eyeing promotions, bigger houses, bigger cars, and so on. They work hard to earn more, then they spend more, then they work even harder to earn much more so they can support their spending. It seems to be the wisdom and way of the 21st century. I'm not suggesting this is good or bad. It's your personal choice. While doing chakra sadhana, the second temptation to resist is the desire to have more. It begins by taking a good look at what all you are already blessed with and by pursuing any material objective with a sense of awareness. Gratitude and mindfulness are like chopsticks you need both to hold the food of temptation. A sadhak progresses and rises above his sexual thoughts and thoughts of creation. A kind of stillness starts to brew in his mind. Undercurrents of restlessness subside and a sense of gratitude arises naturally. Truly, I have everything. This feeling begins to carve a place in your mind. Just like a fully bloomed flower attracts bees naturally, a mind that has gone beyond creation and procreation attracts thoughts of a different nature. Tangled in the second knot now, different desires sprout in the mind. Vishnukrati. Vishnukrati Vibhedini. Somewhere, the root cause of our suffering is a deep desire for permanence. We are not comfortable with the transient nature of this world. We find it hard to believe that everything is temporary. We want our joys, pleasures and attainments to be eternal. We don't want to lose our loved ones and if we could, we would have them by our side always. The desire to hold on, to not let go, whatever we have acquired is one of the strongest desires. Such a desire through limits, such a desire, though limits us greatly, it restricts us and it ties us down. Based on our desire to be eternally happy, we continue working hard and doing things to ensure that we don't lose. This clinging is the seed of all emotions and emotions are the second greatest hurdle for any practitioner. While meditating, when you try to quiet your mind, that's when you become most aware of your emotions. They are not just either positive or negative emotions, but a mixture of both. For emotions are simply those thoughts that did not abandon and now they have found a place in your heart. You go through regret, dependence, guilt, anger, hatred, jealousy, envy, joy, peace and many others. When you let your thoughts brew and not abandon them, they become desires and emotions. Vishnu sustains the creation. Your desires and emotions are the basis of your living. Of your what? Of your living. Mm. Think about it for a moment. Most of us 
us are mostly working towards fulfilling towards what we desire or care about. The note of desires and emotions represent the second hurdle for any sincere seeker. Should you let go of desires and not have emotions? The truth is desires and emotions make us human. They make us who we are. It is not possible to completely let go of either the desires or the emotions. You may not have big desires of making a lot of money or becoming really famous and so on. But that does not mean you are free of desire. The desire to eat something different today. The desire to speak to your loved ones. The desire to watch a movie. The desire to entertain yourself. They are all desires. The harder you have to work to is fulfilling a certain desire, the greater is the joy that you are likely to experience upon its fulfillment. It does not mean the joy will be everlasting or even long lived. Long lived. It simply means the surge of joy you experience is greater than you have to work harder or longer towards its attainment. How we accept what comes to us greatly determines our emotional state and such state in return largely affects our response to those situations. Someone criticizes you and you are unable to accept or reject it. It will trigger a negative emotion in you. It might make you feel down or you might loathe the criticizer. In that state of mind, you may say or do something that you would normally do. If, however, you are able to either reject the criticism outright, quietly in your mind or accept it and flush it out of your system, you will not experience the swelling of any negativity in you. It is easier to swim in a pond than in a whirlpool. When you understand that you don't have to react to your emotions or thoughts while you are meditating on chakras, they become less intense. As their intensity decreases, they no longer remain a whirlpool, but become a silent pond and then you see what lies at the bottom. Everything becomes crystal clear. Your emotions may cause momentary ripples, but they would not be able to become giant whirlpools. As you rise above your sexual thoughts and become somewhat indifferent to your emotions, you start to see the residue. A final and third category of thoughts come and disrupt your meditation. Would you like to go over the Rudra Granthi? Rudra Granthi. Rudra is uh, Shiva, an attribute of Lord Shiva. Madam Rudra, like his and the like Tibetan lore. Isn't it like a demon, hmm? Madame Rudra? Like, is Madame Rudra? Hmm. Madame Rudra. I don't know. There's like that's like a form that all the wrathful deities took mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. Yeah. overcome him. Yeah, right. But yeah. is this like Shiva when he lost Sati or something? Or? Probably, yeah. Yeah. Sati means awareness. The literal meaning of the word Sati is awareness mm-hmm. in Pali language. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when you lose awareness, it's natural that you can get Rudram. Rudram is anger. <laughs> right? It's all symbolic. You know, many of the mythological stories are very symbolic. Mm-hmm. And they have deep philosophical meanings. Uh, if you are insightful and uh, you know, if you are a meditator, you can very easily make out. It will directly convey this, uh, these aspects. Otherwise, they are all just stories. You know, we personify them and we think they are all beings who really exist. Who really existed. Then it becomes like a second person, right? Mm-hmm. Instead of our own emotions yeah, that we conquer, yeah, that we suffer. Everything is what is happening with. Them. They have preserved in the form of stories so that. But, uh, it's easier to preserve that way, you know, it yeah. will, it will yeah, remember. sustain. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's see what he's, uh, he's okay. saying about Rudra Granthi. There comes a stage in life of a serious meditator when he is no longer struggling with sexual thought, when they no longer have any negative feelings toward anyone else. There comes a phase when they are actually grateful, just as the mind starts to experience stillness. Just when they begin to see the colors at the bottom of the reef, they are caught unaware by another wave of thoughts. No, these thoughts are not about having more or building more. They are not about harming anyone. These are much worse. They are self-deprecating thoughts that leave the meditator vulnerable. They make you feel as if you are inadequate, as if you wouldn't ever get there. Your weak moments or failures of the past begin to flash in your inner eye and all you see is what you lack 
as opposed to what you have within you. The third knot is the knot of thoughts called Rudra Granti. It is just after the Agnya Agnya Chakra. Agnya Chakra, the brow plexus. Shiva's role is destruction, not necessarily in the form of annihilation, but determination. Untying this knot is a two-stage process. In the first one, you go beyond your destructive thoughts. You realize that you don't have to hold on to your past. You understand that you can't allow your yesterday to ruin your today. As you meditate with that awareness and commitment, destructive thoughts fly away like frightened birds do at the sound of a loud clap. The second stage is a realization that all thoughts are empty in their own right. They are devoid of any essence that if I don't give them importance, they can't do anything on their own. If you observe carefully, you'll notice that all visible phenomena have a point of origin, a certain life of duration, and a point of termination. The knot is in the brain because as they say, it's all in your head. You may experience certain emotions, you may have desires, and you may long for a physical intimacy. If you are able to terminate the thought in your head though, the desire or emotion will disappear like it never existed. This is the hardest knot to untie, the greatest hoop you have to get through. Rudra Kranti also refers to the onslaught of thoughts you experience while meditating on the chakras. This is also the last stage of Kundalini awakening and the most intense one too. Meditating with unflinching focus and determination, the practitioner has to become like a yogi, like Shiva, to undo this knot. As you progress, you start to become aware of your thoughts effortlessly, just like a bird can naturally fly and a fish can naturally swim. You become naturally aware. No matter how hard or how badly entangled is a knot, you can loosen it by pulling on it. Frustration or intolerance has no role or room in kundalini meditation. A serious practitioner knows that he or she must be extremely patient. We have to examine the knot and then untie it with firm but relaxed hands. That's how you need to look upon Brahma, Vishnu, and Rudra Granti. Some examination, a bit of observation, a lot of patience, and a great deal of effort to untie is required. No knot is hard enough then. If you walk the path and not give up, you will get the results exactly as expected. That is why I don't call it the philosophy, but the science of chakras. It has a definitive cause and effect relationship. Nothing is without a cause and effect in the divine play. Everything is beautifully interlinked, interdependent, and impartial. Next one, when Shiva meets Shakti. Mm, that'll be great. So, and we were going over this Brahma Granthi, Vishnu Granthi and the Rudra Granthi, especially the last portion about the Rudra Granthi, Vibhedini. Vibhedini means to, you know, break open the knot. Mm. The knot is basically an entanglement and uh, to break it open is to, you know, untie those entanglements and be free, be liberated. And uh, I could uh, relate some of the portions we went over in the untethered soul. But only thing is the approach might sound like, like it's an intellectual exercise, right? Substituting certain thought pattern it has to happen in a much uh, deep rooted level according to the teaching of Kundalini. When, when you are working with these nodes because those are all unconscious patterns of your mind they are not at a very surface level if it was at the surface level just by reading a book and understanding and just changing your attitude you can be liberated it doesn't happen but like you were saying even if it's sur surface level or exchanging one thought for another another one like it creates some kind of space to loosen that knot like of it, course, it, it yeah. is helpful it right? definitely, definitely like it, yeah. it points to like Mm -hmm. some techniques <laughs> yeah especially like uh, people who are very gross they might need to start working at the uh, surface level at the periphery you know uh, and then gradually they are able to penetrate deeper and deeper into the but uh, i was mentioning about like a serious practitioner who is a mm. sadhaka mm. and who wants to really break open uh, you know, and untie all these entanglements and be totally liberated and especially when it comes to the Rudra Grandi Vedani, 
Om Swami is mentioning how hard it is. That's probably the hardest one than the creative. Um, and more and more subtle. Mm, and it's sustaining aspects. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The terminating, the terminator. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, there's some, there's some kind of like picture that in Tibetan Buddhism they talk about like the mind being tied in knots and that you have to let them relax in the na- natural state, like snakes naturally untying mm, themselves, mm, like mm. or a greased snake like <laughs> loosening itself. So all this that language of breaking open a knot is even like counter because then our mind's going to resist like he was mentioning also like not building up this like the resistance to our own thoughts our own emotions is what ties the knot tighter but then just this awareness this looking Mm. this investigation this bringing awareness to emotions or desires or thoughts whatever is arising in the mind this is like naturally loosening and letting it unfurl by itself like it has Mm. to have this certain amount of like gentleness patience yeah 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 when this awareness the light of awareness falls into these entanglements these nodes you know that is like a light falls into darkness the darkness dispels mm-hmm. when the light comes right it's as yeah. simple as that there even is with no, one flame mm-hmm. there yeah. is there is no darkness there is no entanglement there is no knot nothing there's only light that's the, that's the or at least you can see where to loosen the knot <laughs> There's no, light. no, no, no. Yeah. When the light is there, there was no note at all. Mm. The note is an illusion, right? It is created out of illusion. It is not there. Like the famous example of the Vedanta, the Renju Sarpa, the rope, you know, it appeared like a snake <laughs> yeah. and you got scared of it. Uh-huh. But when you had the light, you realize it's just a rope and, mm-hmm. you know, there is nothing to be scared about. Mm-hmm. <coughs> exactly. Same thing. <coughs> okay. Let's see what happens when the Shakti meets you next time. Thank you. Thank you.